As August rolled around, both sides had begun to reach out to the larger international community to secure supplies and aid that would help tip the balance in their favor. The world leader at the time, Britain, desired to keep Italy as an ally in the stress of front, and was also under a conservative government at the time who was horrified at the attacks on the Catholic Church and traditional property rights by the Republican government of Spain. They saw both sides as committing horrible wartime atrocities, but ultimately didn't want to see a communist Spain, and therefore tried to remain neutral or, in rhetoric, leaned towards the nationalist. In July, Prime Minister Goral of Spain had reached out to the French Prime Minister, Leon Blum, for help, appealing to him as a fellow socialist. Initially, Blum agreed to help and send planes and equipment, but right-wing groups in France objected, as did the British. By the end of, the Ju of July, the French government announced it could not help, although some who remained sympathetic to the, the struggle in Spain went ahead and sent planes anyway, around 70 aircraft to Barcelona. This eventually led to a formal organization being established called the Non-Intervention Committee, with Britain and France taking the lead. They claimed to help stop arms from reaching the Spanish conflict, but arms still made it through as checks were not really that strict, and much of the supplies to the nationals could come overland through Germany. On September 9th, Britain and France officially signed the Non-Intervention Pact, prohibiting the sale of weapons to the conflict in Spain. Germany and Italy also signed, although they simply continued to ignore it and supply Franco. The U.S. was still fairly isolationist at the point and did not join the Non-Intervention Committee, but did remain neutral in the conflict. FDR refused to admit refugees from Spain, many of whom went to the Soviet Union instead. The U.S. did refuse to sell arms to Spain under the Neutrality Acts passed in 1935. However, oil companies were still allowed to supply the nationalists with oil. The Republicans were now finding that they did not have much help from the international community and decided to turn towards what would become their best option, Stalinist Soviet Union. The common turn in the Soviet Union was very involved in the conflict, supplying weaponry and experts to help coordinate military units. Stalin supported the Republican government as part of his own efforts at collective security, Keeping a sympathetic government in Spain would help France and Russia against Germany. Stalin did not have the same geographic advantage, though, as Hitler or Mussolini when it came to supplying aid. And in other ways, Stalin was also not the best ally. For instance, while Hitler and Mussolini allowed Franco aid on credit, Stalin made the Republican government pay him in gold reserves up front. On October 25th, Finance Minister Negrin shipped the gold reserves of the Bank of Spain to Moscow as a down payment for weapons. Reportedly, enough gold was paid to the Soviets for tanks that they could pave all of Red Square in Moscow. Another problem the Republicans encountered with the Soviets was that the advisors that were sent tended to want to push Stalinist ideology that was largely disagreed with by other Marxist groups like the Trotskyist POUM and anarchist groups. To make matters worse, the Soviet advisors often were put up in nice accommodations like hotels in Madrid and kept isolated from the anarchists and others who felt they were being exploited in this war. What the Soviets did do was send planes, tanks, and anti-aircraft guns that were generally superior to the Italian and German ones, and they also helped organize international brigades of volunteers from around the world who came to fight fascism. The people who volunteered for these international brigades were leftists who felt Spain was the scene of a battle to stop the evils of fascism and Nazism. Some countries tried to stop their citizens from leaving by passing laws to make it illegal for individuals to go overseas and participate in battles, but around 35,000 still volunteered and were smuggled into the country to help fight. There were seven brigades organized by country or origin. This included the famous Abraham Lincoln Brigade, pictured here. Around 500 arrived in October of 1936, and then the rest came later. The Air National Brigades helped actually bolster the nationalist claim that this was a war against the spread of communism and the Soviet Union, something Franco would maintain until his death in 1975. Overall, the brigades were not too powerful and didn't really help the Republicans in a significant way, but did buy them some time in significant battles, and offered a morale boost. On the other side of things, General Mola and Franco were working to secure help from Italy and Germany. They sent an emissary to Rome to meet Mussolini early on. 
Mussolini was reluctant at first, but once he learned France was not getting involved and thus there was no danger of a war with France, he went ahead and started sending planes to the nationalist. Mussolini had ideological motives, wanting to check international communism, but he also had political motives, wanting access to the Atlantic Ocean and to build on his success in Ethiopia. Italy would send close to 70,000 men to fight in Spain, along with hundreds of tanks and planes. Mussolini hoped this war would be a quick victory that would allow him to uh, gain support at home and project himself as a protector of Catholicism. Franco and Mola also reached out to Germany in July of 36, but initially Germany was reluctant and said no. Eventually, on July 23rd, Nazis who were stationed in North Africa went ahead and went to Hitler personally with the request from Franco. At this point, Hitler was persuaded, and without consulting any advisors, he went ahead and proclaimed that he would help Franco. He said publicly this was to stop communism's spread, but in reality was probably trying to keep France on its toes by destabilizing its southern border with Spain. Germany would also benefit from imported minerals from areas of Spain rich in minerals, and also could use Spain as a testing ground for new strategies and weapons it was developing. Around 12,000 Germans would serve in the Spanish Civil War and prove vital to the success of the Nationalist. Germany gave artillery, tanks, etc. to the Nationalist. The most significant contribution, though, was aircraft, including the Luftwaffe unit called the Condor Legion that fought for the Nationalist in the war. The Republicans had no comparable air force. The Condor Legion was led by Colonel Wolfram von Vick Richthofen, who was cousin of the Red Baron, the hero of World War I. On July 29th, the first bombers arrived in Morocco from Germany. Planes began ferrying the Foreign Legion and Franco's forces to mainland Spain in an operation known as Operation Magic Fire, nicknamed this by Hitler in an ode to a Wagner opera. The arrival of Franco's Army of Africa to Andalusia was the first major shift in the war. For one, it gave a boost in the number of troops available. It also allowed Franco to begin posturing himself as the leader of the nationalist movement, since he now had the largest army in Spain and was receiving Nazi aid exclusively. The obvious strategy was to head north to Madrid. Franco chose a westerly route to Madrid that was the longer of two proposed routes, but would end up taking Republican territory along the way. The army was made up of battalions of 600 men accompanied by 225 Moroccan regulars and artillery. They had air cover from Nazi planes. They moved at an incredible speed, covering 200 miles in under a week. Along the way, they destroyed local militias and killed any captured leaders. News of their terror spread, and masses of people fled areas in their path. They were too small, small to hold areas and impose law and order, so instead they just terrorized local populations into um, falling in line. They also took revenge against anyone they saw as perpetuating an atrocity against the church. The Legion and Moroccan soldiers became a byword for cruelty. Franco saw his march through western Spain as part of a second Reconquista, similar to when Catholic defenders had driven out the Moors 400 years earlier. All of the bloodshed and violence, he said, was justified in the name of saving Spain from alien forces. He had failed to see the irony in the, his use of Muslim regulars from Morocco in this conquest and metaphor. Franco next marched towards Madrid, taking the town of Talavera de Reina in a day on September 2nd. Madrid was now less than 70 miles away. At this point, though, Franco decided instead of going to, to Madrid, he would go to Toledo and help out the besieged Colonel Moscardo in Alcazar. He saw this as a morale-boosting victory. On September 27, 1936, his army arrived, took Toledo from the Republicans, and Franco proclaimed that this was the work of God, that God had chosen him to help the Spanish people. On September 4th, Largo Calabrero had become the head of the Republican government. Nicknamed the Spanish Lenin, he had taken part in the Asturias Uprising in 1934. His cabinet was also made up of socialists like Prieto and Negrin. Caballero was both prime minister and minister of war. Azana remained president. The Republicans struggled to keep together their fragile coalition. Caballero thought maybe if he organized the units into what would be called the Popular Army, uh, instead of various militias, it would help out. 
So they did this and put Soviet officers in charge. However, people can, can continued to still informally organize themselves with regional and ideological divisions. By contrast, the military on the nationalist side was one and the same with the political leadership, with Francisco Franco at the top calling himself Generalissimo, or Supreme General. One of the first major battles was the First Battle of Madrid, which began on October 29th, when nationalists began a heavy bombardment of Madrid while the Army of Africa advanced in the southwest. On November 4th, the Soviets went into action for the first time with their planes and tanks. However, despite this, on November 6th, the Republican government decided to go ahead and relocate their capital from Madrid to Valencia, leaving General Miage of the Madrid Military Division in charge of the defense of Madrid with Soviet advisors. International brigades and the Popular Army fought back against the Nationalist advance in November with the rallying cry, They shall not pass, and Madrid will be the tomb of fascism. Under this environment of heightened fear and stress, the Republicans left in charge decided to massacre all Nationalist prisoners in Madrid prisons for fear of them rising up as the Army of Africa approached. This massacre of 2,000 prisoners was considered to be the worst Republican orchestrated massacre of the war. A massive propaganda campaign was attempted to boost morale. Russian planes dropped leaflets calling for Madrid to act like Petrograd in the First World War. Cinemas showed Russian films about the Russian Revolution. And it worked. Civilians streamed to Madrid's defense, dug trenches in the streets, and made makeshift barricades. Women were especially important in the defense of Madrid, picking up guns and defending the city, as well as boiling oil to dump on the nationalists when they invaded. On November 16th, the Army of Africa finally broke through and entered Madrid's University City, where the university was located. The school buildings became the site of fighting and occupation by either side. One famous incident in this battle took place in November, when the university was attacked and fighting took place from floor to floor. At times, grenades were sent up via elevator. During this fight, books were used as barriers. At one point, the Nationalists ate experimental rabbits and sheep, and 50 of them died from this, not realizing those animals had been dosed with chemicals. Don't tell Mrs. Gray with Zimmy. Meanwhile, from November 19th to the 22nd, the Condor Legion bombed the city in the most intense bombings of the war thus far. The Nationalists uh, bombarded Madrid, attempting to break Republican control. The Republicans used cinema lights as searchlights and instituted a block blackout by shooting at any windows with candles lit and painting over street lamps with dark colors. People slept in the metro or cellars. On November 23rd, Franco declared Madrid could not be taken. A stalemate had been reached. Trench warfare was developing in places. Madrid would stay Republican, but under siege for the remainder of the war. Several more battles would take place around Madrid throughout the war.